The United States Post Office Department was one of the oldest government agencies in America. Benjamin Franklin was appointed the first Postmaster General in 1775. Although millions of Americans depend on the post office, for the first nearly 200 years, delivering the mail was not a well-paying job. In the beginning of the 1970s, the average postal employee earned barely enough to get off of welfare. Employees with over 20 years of service averaged just over $8,000 a year, practically poverty level. But on March 17, 1970, the New York Letter Carriers Union Local No. 36 decided enough is enough and went on strike. Within 48 hours, workers in Boston, Cleveland, Pittsburgh, Denver, San Francisco, Los Angeles, and 3,000 carriers in Chicago join ranks. By March 23rd, Chicago striking workers had grown to 31,000. James Worsham was a Chicago letter carrier and a member of the union's branch number 11. He remembers just how bad it was at that time. Well, prior to the strike, we uh, had collective begging we would go to the Congress with our hat in our hand, and the majority of the carriers that were working had to end up uh, with two jobs in order to really support their families, you know. And so I guess we just got fed up and we went on a strike in uh, 1970. And as a result of that strike, uh, the salary and the fringe benefits, everything, be, you know, began to uh, become much better, you know. And so uh, I end up uh, making a career out of it. At the time of the strike, Worsham was the union steward at Chicago's Grand Crossing Station. He believed in the union and the power of standing together to create necessary change. In 1978, Worsham's fellow letter carriers demonstrated their confidence in him and elected him president of the National Association of Letter Carriers, branch number 11. The majority of the members in the Chicago union were African Americans and Worsham made sure they were well represented. When I first began, uh, got involved with the union, there were very few blacks in, in any kind of uh, leadership uh, position. And uh, when I first was elected uh, the president of this branch, the uh, attendance at the meetings and at the conventions, it was uh, predominantly white. It was uh, very few blacks. And after I got in, more and more began to migrate and then it became where uh, I used to tell them sometimes they need to go somewhere other than Chicago because you look at the, the union in Chicago and you think that's uh, a microscope of, of the entire union, and it's not. So when they went to conventions, then they found out that from these other cities, the, they were predominantly white. In August of 1970, Republican President Richard Nixon signed into law the Postal Reorganization Act abolishing the United States Post Office Department as a part of the cabinet and created the United States Postal Service, a corporate-like independent agency. It was a direct outcome of the postal strike. The new Postal Service was given an official monopoly on the delivery of mail in the United States. This was before the creation of private delivery services like FedEx and UPS. Worsham's success in the union continued to grow. He held both local and national offices in his union and even led his membership into building a new state-of-the-art postal facility building on South Cottage Grove Avenue in Chicago. In 2003, after working 40 years in the U.S. postal system, James Worsham retired. And in 2005, a bill introduced by Illinois Congressman Bobby Rush was passed and the Cottage Grove facility was renamed the James E. Worsham Building. In 2010, a young former union steward named Mac I. Julian was elected president of the Chicago Letter Carriers Union. He had become an officer of Branch No. 11 in 2005 and re-elected by acclamation in 2006. Julian was a graduate of the National Association of Letter Carriers Leadership Academy and also appointed to the regional office by the union's national president. He had proven his willingness to lead and he had the credentials to back it up. Uh, management was not used to the kind of resistance that I brought to the table 
And what I'll never forget was my manager telling me as I was pointing out to her a violation of the contract. And she said, well, you know, you're probably right. If you can show me where it is in the contract and, you know, we'll make sure that it's followed. And I told her, well, I'm not quite sure where it is, but I know it's in the contract. She said, well, I'll tell you what. She handed the book to me and she pat me on my shoulder. You find out where it is in the contract and we'll make sure it's followed. You know, I kind of walked away with my tail tucked between my legs and everything, but that was a mistake on her part because I read the contract and I read her manual and I read the postal letter carrier's manual. And I came back with a lot of things that she needed to follow in that office. So uh, that was that was the bumpy ride. But when the membership saw that they were being represented and we were not compromising and that we needed to stick together, like Mr. Worsham said, uh, you know, they, they, they rallied behind me, and it, it is the members, it's always the members that make the union strong. In the nearly 10 years since Mr. Worsham's retirement, the Postal Service has come under attack from Congress. Many senators and congressmen have expressed a desire to see the Postal Service privatized, which would cost thousands of letter carriers their jobs, and perhaps create a tremendous void in the American middle class. Look, there, there's people who want to, who would love to see the Postal Service privatized. Make no mistake about it, the Postal Service is still generating some $65 billion of revenue a year. So there, there are factions out there that would like to cut up the Postal Service and privatize it and, uh, you know, reap those benefits. The Postal Service in and of itself is not failing or defaulting, uh, as we've been hearing in the news. Actually, it's Congress who's defaulting on the Postal Service. It was legislation that was created in 2006, which put a mandate on the Postal Service to pre-fund retirees' health benefits for the next 75 years. And it had to do so within a 10-year window. So the Postal Service has been paying something like $5.5 billion a year to pre-fund the health benefits of people who are not even born yet. You know, not to mention who don't work for the Postal Service. And now, one side of the argument, you hear, well, the Postal Service is no longer as relevant as it used to be. Technology is taking us out, email, Facebook. Uh, but if the Postal Service is not gonna be around much longer, then why are we pre-funding the retirees' health benefits for the next 75 years? You know, it's a shell game. It's, a, it's an excuse to uh, break up the Postal Service. The Postal Service, at the time that the law was created in 2006, was seeing record profits, uh, record mail volume. Of course, we hit the Great Recession. Uh, and the Postal Service, through its pensions funds and the overfunding of the retirees' health benefits, have stored away billions of dollars in these accounts. So if it wasn't for this mandate, again, the Postal Service would be turning a profit. In fact, in the first fiscal quarter of this year, the Postal Service had a $200 million operational profit. They didn't report that. They reported a $3.3 billion loss that was associated with the requirement for the pre-funding. Now, we all know August 1st came, they didn't pay that bill. All, September 30th come, they're not gonna pay that bill. So there was never an out-of-pocket $3 billion loss. There's so much great potential for the Postal Service, but unfortunately, there's that faction that would like to see unions and the Postal Service destroyed. Although privatization would affect all Americans, Julian is quick to point out that in his Chicago union, African-American letter carriers would be most affected. You look around Chicago and you see who is employed in these public sector jobs, particularly letter carriers. Over 80%, I would say, of uh, our members in the Chicago area are African-American. And, you know, with a, middle co with a middle class income, we are the job creators. You know, you know we are out there spending uh, that money. We have the income that keep the beauty shops and the barber shops and some of these mom pa opens, you know, within the neighborhood. So by virtue of uh, us being firmly embedded in the middle class, it's that domino effect in the communities that we support by our income, the homeowners, the taxes that we pay. You know, you put these people out of work and you're gonna devastate not just these communities, but it's gonna have an impact on the greater uh, city as well. Along with the loss of middle class jobs, millions of average citizens would lose their contact with the outside world if they were no longer directly served by their postal carriers.
and that it will hurt those who rely on the postal service the most. Those in urban communities, uh, those in disadvantaged uh, communities within urban areas, those in rural communities, because these, uh, these individuals who are privatized or will seek to get a piece of this pie, they're not going to want to go where it's not making them money. And, you know, even today, UPS, FedEx, we deliver 25% of their goods every day. You may see brown all around Chicago, but you're not going to see brown down in Odell, Illinois, or these little small communities. And if it was privatized, you know, would they want to go into some of the most disadvantaged neighborhoods? You know, would they want to go in some of these areas that the postal service, that the letter carriers go through every day, where they literally put their lives on the line because of uh, all the challenges those communities face? No, they wouldn't. The only reason that uh, the postal service you know, exists the way that it does is because we're, there's that constitutional mandate to provide universal service. That congressional mandate, written into law in 1970, clearly states, the cost of establishing and maintaining the postal service shall not be apportioned to impair the overall value of such service to the people. But you have a constitutional right to have postal service, you know, within your community, six days a week and door to door. Although the future of the Postal Service may seem questionable, for years technological advances have been viewed as a possible threat. But this people-driven institution has always prevailed. This is not the first time we've been down this path. Uh, you think about the telegraph, uh, the telephone, fax machines were surely going to take us out because you can get the message over there within a minute. Uh, but there's always a need for the Postal Service. We see technology, we see the opportunity to embrace what technology can bring to the table. When I refer to the $200 million operational profit in the first fiscal quarter, that largely came because of packaged goods. People are shopping online. And if people are shopping online, then they need someone to deliver it. And, you know, we look uh, for the opportunities to take advantage of other delivery modes, you know, whether it's uh, partnering with the local pharmacy and grocery store to deliver goods. We have the best postal network in the world. So yeah, let's utilize it. We go to every address in this country. We're looking for ways to, you know, to embrace this technology as opposed to run from it. People are always going to use the Postal Service in some form or fashion. Uh, for us, we just need to find a way to continue to make it useful to our customers. The problem is we're becoming a country of the haves and the have-nots. You take away this option, and again, who will it impact the most? Those in rural communities, those are in disadvantaged communities. So that's why they want to take away that option. You know, and at the same time, they're taking away hundreds of thousands of jobs as well. You know, we can't afford to allow uh, segments of our population to be left behind in this technology, in this whole uh, era of technology advances, you know. Uh, there, you know, there's a segment of the population that don't have computers that's not online, and they still rely on the Postal Service because the Postal Service is reliable. Both President Julian and Mr. Warsham are encouraging American citizens to let their voices be heard. They see the pitfalls ahead and are constantly making citizens aware of the threats to their rights and liberties. The biggest challenge for us is getting the American people informed, getting our customers informed. You know, I've been on various TV shows and radio shows. Uh, Cliff Kelly has supported us a lot. He's had me on a few times. And, you know, each time I come on, it, it's as if someone calls in, they say that they've never heard this story. Uh, so we try to get that message out there. Contact your congressman, contact your senator. You know, fortunately, in the greater Chicago area, all the congressmen are right there with us. Uh, they, they, they've been with us from the start. Uh, you know, we've put a little pressure on our senators, uh, but Senator Durbin has been great. Uh, so, you know, we, we need for uh, the communities to speak up and to fight for their postal service. Don't allow them to close the post offices within your community because, it, you know, there's, you have a constitutional right to have a post office in your community and postal service. A lot of it has to be uh, political. If, if the elections don't go the right way, if we get the, uh, stacked with the Republicans in the House and the, and the Senate, uh, they could very well destroy the Postal Service. They're talking about going to five days, and then if you open the door for that, then they can go for four days, three days. And, and it's, it's just, uh, you know, I, I don't see them really caring about the Postal Service. Uh, and yet, 
we are the only uh, organization, the only workforce that touches the American people every day, everybody, everybody in the United States. We, we come in contact with them every day. And so uh, I, I'm just, I am concerned. Uh, I, don't, I don't see the, uh, the backbone and, and support from the Congress and the Senate like, like it, it should be. The Black United Fund of Illinois is a not-for-profit 5013C corporation headquartered in Chicago, Illinois. It is supported through grants, payroll deductions, and your charitable contributions. To find out more about the Black United Fund of Illinois, please visit our website at buffy.org.